Hey YouTube! Lately I've been playing a ton of the Gwent standalone, and I found this game to be incredibly deep from both a gameplay and deck building perspective. Unfortunately, without a replay mode, actually analyzing my games was difficult. While laddering, I had many games I wished I was able to go back to and see what went wrong, so I started recording every game that I played for that purpose. In this, what I hope to be a series, we're going to analyze some of the more interesting games I've been playing in hopes that it can make us all better Gwent players. In this game, I'm playing a Hensel Brew deck that I've been having success with, and my opponent is on the accepted best deck in Skellige Restore Abuse. This matchup is definitely not in my favor. As of this recording, my record against the deck is only 5-7, with a couple of my wins being due to obvious missteps from my opponent. This game is around 4300 MMR on the regular ladder. I lead on reinforced trebuchet, as I do in every matchup with this deck. I want the trebuchet out as quickly as possible, as it is my intended Hensel target, and I want to have that option available. His Kingbrand sends a raider, so I know his hand has Oligard in it. Here I make the first questionable play of the game. I opt to Siege Support instead of just hensolding my trebuchet. In matchups where Scorch is a concern, leading on the Siege Support makes sense, as it drastically reduces the effectiveness of Scorch for not much downside. Even outside of Scorch though, it's also an extra point, as the Siege Support ticks on Hensel himself, making up for the lost turn of trebuchet volleys. The major reason to Hensel first here is that I want to force my opponent out of this round as quickly as possible, as his hand has a low tempo oil geared that he badly wants to get out of his hand. If I hensel my trebuchet here, I'm immediately ahead by a point, and the trebuchets are ticking for 3 per turn. If he plays Olgeard on the following turn, which is likely the last turn where it would make tempo, it would only be up by 5 points going into my turn, and I can easily make tempo for the rest of the round without needing to play any of my siege supports, saving them for later rounds. In this round, the siege support ends up being largely a wasted play. After my siege support gets quarreled, I make what is definitely a mistake in playing out the second one. This deck, unlike most Hensel decks, is heavily reliant on access to siege support. Almost all of my cards become significantly more powerful with it in play. Although plan A for most Hensel decks is to pull the Siege Supports, this deck almost never wants to do so in round 1, as Siege Support plus the rest of my deck is the intended win condition for the second round I have to win. By playing the second Siege Support here, I don't have easy access to it for later rounds. This play also gives him an easy window to get the Olgeard out of his hand. It's worth noting here that my placement might just be bad here. In my experience with this matchup, Lacerate tends to be the scariest card, but you also want to play around Harpooner, which just sets you up for big Lacerates anyway. My placement here sort of plays around the Lacerate, but the Trebuchet without any armor on it should definitely be on the row with the other armorless cards. This lets Lacerate be an 11 point card, which sounds pretty bad, until you play this deck for a while and constantly get hit by 20 point or even worse Lacerates. The main reason for this odd looking setup is that Harpooner plus Lacerate would kill the armorless Trebuchet, reducing my points per turn by 1. Where if the armorless Trebuchet is on the middle row with everything else, Harpooner plus Lacerate is only 8 points on the 9 point Trebuchets. The setup would be better still if instead of playing the Siege Support on the middle row on the previous turn, I played it on the top. This allows for the middle row to just be Trebuchet and the Statue, which totally plays around Lacerate as well. This Sheila is a little risky. If the Rally hits a Siege Support, I kinda just lose, but I really want to force my opponent out of this round so that I have better control over round 2. Thankfully I hit the biggest card, draw one of the best cards I could draw, and it all works out. I think I would have preferred to hit Ram here to get a tick off Morgvarg, but this is fine. Now I'm with 7 plus 3 per turn, on even cards with a Siege Support in play. This is the point where I'm certain that I'm definitely winning this round, at least. We see one of those big Lacerates I was talking about. 14 points is pretty big, but as this is happening, I'm actually pretty glad this Lacerate is only getting him 14 points, and he's doing it in a round that I'm pretty confident that I'm able to win. I have a few options here. Battering Ram solidly makes tempo and gets to tick off his Morgvarg. Deathmold isn't particularly good in this matchup. I could just thunder off a 7-point guy to get Deathmold out of my hand while making tempo. PFI would put me up 7 points plus 3 per turn, which is probably good enough to force a pass. Instead, I choose a very questionable line of battering ramming for pure points, putting up 9 plus 3, and definitely forcing the pass. At the end of this round, we see Siege Support was a 15-point bronze after accounting for the crewman trigger and the boosts. 13, if you consider that two of the points last rate lost, would have been wasted on 2-point flanks rather than the 3-point flanks. Overall, this is pretty low for a Siege Support, especially since having access to Siege Support lets me play a longer round 2. I think this round would have ended a turn or two sooner had I just immediately gunned Hensel instead of dirtling around getting Siege Support online, and I would have been much more favored to win one of the next two rounds in a more complex game. So after winning round 1 on even, the plan is generally to simplify the game down, force the Resurrects, and hope to not let them have Ceres for round 3, and win with some absurd Shani into Sheila plus Rally for a million points. Instead, I choose not to play a single turn of this round correctly, leading on Daragari is a clear signal to my opponent, hey, I'm not committing to this round, and because of his carryover, it doesn't really force him to commit anything either. He makes an Ekimara of his own, and I get a little spooked. I decided to commit into this round, which I should have done last turn instead of playing the Ekimara, so at least I'd get the two extra points. In the game, he has Eskel though, so the sequencing error doesn't matter too much. Here I make yet another terrible play by passing. At the very least I should be playing these PFIs. With no more CH supports left, PFI is only a 10 point bronze, which I'd rather trade with random cards in his hand now. In my head, at the time, I was worried I wouldn't be able to bait enough reses to prevent Saris from coming back. 
and I'd rather fight all that carryover in a more complex game. The problem with that logic is that the static 10-point cards that get blown out by last rate aren't really complicating the game state in my favor. Simplifying pretty much any two cards out of his hand in round 2 is almost certainly going to favor me. Well, now that I kept the PFIs around, I find Horn, which certainly makes the PFI much better. Mulling the second PFI is a really easy decision, as it's by far the worst card in my hand, and I need the first light to combo with the Sheila that I'm going to shiny back. This Dorogari for Ekimara is where I'm pretty sure I've lost the game. Ekimara eating the Dorogari end means he has Sigdrifa for an absurd amount of points. I shiny first because sequencing doesn't really matter here, and I'd like to draw my Sheila card and see what I'm working with before I make any more decisions. Stannis next, because if I hit Death Mold, I'll be able to zap there before it gets value, while the rest of the cards in my hand are just point plays, or cards that I don't want to play until as late as possible. Sequencing between these next few cards isn't really a big difference. The only thing that really matters is that I don't want to play either Decree or PFI until I absolutely need to. PFI because I'm scared of Lacerate. I saw an Herbalist earlier, so I know his deck is a second Lacerate in him. Running the numbers, there are a few outcomes if I put his last card to be Lacerate. If I lead with PFI, he gets a 17 point Lacerate and I'm hopelessly out of range of winning. However, if I decree for Philippa, and assume that I get full value out of it, the last rate is only for 10 points, and I win easily by following up with PFI as the last card. Last rate isn't the only card I'm worried about, though. His deck also had Armorsmith, which would absolutely destroy the Philippa line, essentially making it a one-point play, unless I had insane luck and juggled shots perfectly. Leading with the PFI here completely plays around the Armorsmith. In the moment, I didn't have time to work through which cards he had left, but I was pretty sure those were the two cards that I would be able to play around. Looking back now, I know that the five remaining cards, assuming that he was playing the Card for Card Swim net deck, were Gremis, Armorsmith, Lugos, Lacerate, and Harpooner. Of those, I have lines that beat the Lacerate and the Armorsmith. Lugos, Harpooner, and Gremis all outvalue both the Philippa and the PFI by one or two points. This last real play of the game is the reason I wanted to review this game. So in hindsight, if I make a guess to play on one of those two cards, I'm winning about 20% of the time. Instead, I try to get the best of both worlds, unable to figure out what to do and what the rest of his cards are, a Royal Decree for DJ. My reasoning was if I DJ into Thaler and grab Philippa, I get to defer the decision until next turn, effectively allowing to play around both Lacerate and Armorsmith. Hitting Philippa plus Death Mold seemed like it should be enough points to let me play through the Armorsmith, so as long as the DJ doesn't hit First Light, I should be fine. And if DJ hits First Light plus Philippa, I'm basically in the same position as if I just decreed for Philippa directly. Let's look at the raw numbers of this play. In hindsight, I see that there are three cases where I win the game. If DJ hits Philippa plus Death Mold, that's 22 points and beats every card he can have, all five of them. In case two, if DJ hits Thaler plus Death Mold and the Thaler draws Philippa, it's an 11 point play and it beats both Lacerate and Armorsmith. In case three, if DJ hits Thaler plus Philippa and draws Death Mold, it's an 11 point play that beats only Lacerate. Case one happens 16% of the time, where case two and three both happen about 10% of the time. So case one wins 100% of the time, Case 2 wins 40% of the time, and Case 3 wins 20% of the time. This gives us an overall win percentage of 24%. So in hindsight, this DJ takes what's about a 20% win chance with your leading on Philippa or PFI to something that adds up to around a 24% chance to win. So it looks like my in-game instinct was barely right, and I made the correct play here, as dubious as it looked in hindsight. Since I started working on this review last night, I felt significantly more comfortable in this matchup when I queue into it. I hope you're also able to take something away from this analysis. Feel free to leave a comment down below if you think I'm overlooking something that could be learned from here. Until next time.